Systems analysis is a very generic term, and it's meant to be that way. A system is something like a laptop computer, a battlefield full of soldiers, uh, an audiovisual system, anything you can draw a boundary around and say, I have objects in here, and they interact with each other. That's a system. And systems analysis is studying that system, trying to understand, one, how it behaves right now when it's operating, or two, trying to understand how it would behave when you change the conditions in which it exists, such as how it would, ex how it would operate in a, a conceivable battlefield situation, for example. Well, I'm going to jump back to 1912 to start this lecture. In 1912, Frederick Lanchester was an engineer working in the automotive and aircraft industries. And he set for himself the task of understanding how attrition works on the battlefield. When two big forces come marching in against each other and clash, there is an attrition rate, and each side kills each other off. And he started searching for the curves that described that attrition rate. And he arrived at a curve that described that attrition rate based on the size of the two forces that came together. And those became known as the Lanchester equations. Now in their general form, they look like this. The first law he came up with was Lanchester's square law. Lanchester's square law says that the attrition against a defending unit is equal to the size of the attacking unit. And the size of that attacking unit is multiplied by a coefficient of effectiveness, which describes how powerful or how effective the weapons of the attacker are against this particular kind of defender. And that's essentially what the, the, the equation says. The, the square law works for aimed fire, meaning I am looking at you, and I am pointing, and I am pulling the trigger. Tank battles, plane battles, things where you bring lots of forces together, and they're shooting at each other as they see each other. He also described the linear law. And the linear law says that the attrition against the defender is proportional to the strength of the attacker and the strength of the defender together. Again, multiplied times a coefficient of effectiveness. This is applied to unaimed fire, where you don't see what you're shooting at. You're throwing artillery shells over the hill, for example. And the number of shells going over is part of the equation, and the number of targets it's landing on is the other part of the equation. These are very generic differential equations. And their very genericness is what's kept them alive from 1912 to 1999. There's even a general form of the law, and that's just throwing in a couple of more coefficients to show you know, this value could be 0, or 1. And you can create the general form of Lanchester's equations. I want to show you two examples of how this has been applied more practically. More practically, instead of looking at the attacker as one big glob and saying he's a glob known as a tank regiment, and he's shooting as a glob known as a uh, lo uh, logistics company moving around, you can break it out into individual equipment types. And so what they've done is described the coefficient of effectiveness that applies to armored vehicles shooting at trucks. Add to that the effectiveness of armored, I mean of armored vehicles shooting at trucks and regular vehicles shooting at trucks. So you've essentially broken down the attacker, in this example, to three unique kinds of vehicles, each one with his own coefficient of effectiveness. So it allows you to give more firepower to the tanks, less firepower to the jeeps. Instead of having one average number for the entire glob of the attacker, you have numbers specifically for each vehicle type. And you have the numbers that match specific target types as well. So as two units smash together, you don't see the attrition of the entire unit go down equally. You see the soft targets go down faster than the hard targets. And that's the first modernization of Lanchester's equation. The second modernization recognized that the coefficient of effectiveness sitting between these could be anything. And so in a model called the core battle simulation, they have thrown in factors that describe whether the attacking unit is in mop gear as a result of a chemical attack, what his uh, ammunition levels are, his personnel levels, how much of his forces are vectored in towards this target versus another target, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
that coefficient of effectiveness is very, very flexible and you can stretch it to include all kinds of variables coming out of a software model. And that's what they've done in the core battle simulation. That was the beginning of ideas that emerge under operations research later on. Operations research is strictly the scientific method of providing executives with quantitative basis for decisions regarding the operations under their control. Scientific advice to decision makers. And the operations research community has defined their method as number one, collect data about the system that you're going to analyze. Number two, find the correlations between the variables within the system you're going to analyze. Number three, define the measures of effectiveness. What is important in the operations of this system? In some cases, cases, attrition levels are key. In other cases, it's the number of parts you can manufacture per hour. But identify what are the key measures of effectiveness for this system. The things you want to see increase or decrease. Then conduct experiments with your system. And finally, analyze the output of those experiments until you understand how the system works and what the interactions are between multiple parts of that system. <clears throat> As a science, operations research emerged in 1935 in the United Kingdom. Uh, they created the Committee for the Scientific Survey of Air Defense. And from there it spread into the U.S. in 1942 in which we created a couple of Navy organizations which were our first forays into the operations research field. I'm going to show you a couple of examples of operations research studies that were conducted during World War II when the science was brand new, also when the science was being applied directly to real combat. There was a situation where the German U-boats were operating in the Bay of Biscayne. And the British wanted to keep them out of there because they were torpedo torpedoing Allied ships. So the British began flying anti-submarine aircraft around the Bay of Bis Biscayne looking for surfaced submarines. And they would search the waves looking for the top of a submarine. And when they found it, they'd fly over and throw out some depth charges, try to sink it. In the course of a two-year period, these are the detections that they got on submarines in the Bay of Biscayne. They varied anywhere from four detections per month to 100 detections per month. Well, there's a lot of variation there. And you want to know what's causing that variation. Well, two factors are very obvious. The first factor is how many aircraft are you flying? How many hours are they actually up there? And as you look at the curve of the number of hours the aircraft spent searching, you'll see that there's some correlation between the number of detections and the number of hours in the air. OK, that's probably true. There's also some curves where our detection drops way low when our hours in the air is still high. I wonder what's causing that. Well, the other mostly obvious fact is how many submarines are actually there to be detected. There might not be very many during one month. And so your number of detections goes way down just because they're not out there. Yes, that, those are two of the factors that went into how many detections per month we were achieving. But there was also a game of cat and mouse going on at the same time. Initially, we equipped our anti-submarine aircraft with L-band radars to search the waves looking for a return from these submarines on the surface. The Germans didn't know we had done that. And so as we're sailing around, we're getting better at using those L-band radars, and we're finding them more and more often. The Germans do recognize that they're being detected more often, and they don't like it. Well, their first response is to start submerging at night, because more of the detections were happening at night at that time. So they thought, well, we'll stay below the waves at night, and they won't be able to find us as often. And sure enough, that did contribute to lowering the number of detections per month. But it didn't take long before German intelligence found out what we were doing. They found out that those aircraft weren't just looking out the window anymore, that they had L-band radars. So the Germans equipped the submarines with L-band radar receivers. And all of a sudden, our number of detections dropped dramatically because they would recognize that they had been pinged with a radar and they would submerge before the aircraft arrived to deliver the depth charge. So our detections go way down. And we say, man, this isn't, this isn't going well. Well, in response, we take those L-band radars off of the planes and equip them with S-band radars. 
Now we're sailing around searching the waves and when we ping them, their receivers don't know we've pinged them. And they stay on the surface, we fly over, drop our depth charges, get a few more submarines. Uh, again, the Germans are at first mystified. What is going on here? Well, it took a while before they recognized that we must have switched radars. But while they were still trying to figure this out, again, they reduced operations in the Bay of Biscayne and say, let's not go in there. They're detecting us too often. Again, German intelligence finds out we've switched to S-band radar and they put S-band receivers on. And again, our detections drop dramatically. That's the application of operations research during World War II. They were studying how can we find those submarines and they discovered that they could do these things, but also that there was a direct impact on, one, the use of technology, and two, the quality of our ability to keep a secret, or the quality of German intelligence. That's, that's operations research at work.